come to the second morning session. We will start with Juan Maldacena from the Institute of Advanced Study. Oh, well. uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference and also for inviting me to speak in it. So I'll make some comments on uh, the wave function of the universe. Um, and this is based on papers that we wrote with uh, the first two people here, Joaquin Tureachi and Shen Bin Yang. And there was a closely related paper by Kotler, Jensen, and Maloney. And then the final remarks will be things we were talking about with these two, uh, with Chen and Lin. So when we do a small coupling or semi-classical expansion uh, in gravity, uh, we think that the answers we get should correspond to a WKB-like approximation to a wave function of the universe. And uh, you can think of this as uh, like a positive frequency part of the solution of a kind of Plan gordon equation, which would be the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. We don't know the precise form of that equation in full quantum gravity, um, but we think that um, ordinary semi-classical gravity should be an approximation of roughly this kind. Uh, there are many possible solutions, um, and Hartle and Hawking proposed a particular solution that chooses both the classical solution uh, and the wave function for the quantum fluctuations around the classical solution, which is what we denoted there by Psi Schrodinger, that would be, that's the part uh, corresponding to the quantum fluctuations that obeys the first order uh, Schrodinger-like equation on the original, back on the background. Um, so this uh, solution that this proposal of Hartle and Hawking is uh, based on uh, the following. So you start with uh, some boundary geometry, which um, um, which you specify, you specify a three geometry, and then you fill it in using a Lorentzian geometry, and also that uh, Euclidean part of the geometry, so it's really a geometry that uh, has uh, this both Euclidean and Lorentzian signature, and it's inspired by the I epsilon prescription, so the idea that um, even in ordinary quantum field theory, in order to choose the vacuum, we do a little bit of evolution into Euclidean time. And so here, we, uh, once you allow some Euclidean time evolution, then you have this possibility of closing of the universe and getting a, a prediction for the wave function of the universe. And um, this, uh, when you evaluate the wave, the wave function of the universe this way, you find the result that uh, its uh, square is proportional to the Zeta entropy. Now, the most conservative claim is that this captures the, this positive frequency part of the asymptotic wave function, so the wave function in the far future for very big spaces. And you don't need to make claims about other pieces. And this is what we claim in ADS-CFT, and this is what we know most for sure in the ADS-CFT case. Um, now, this wave function uh, gives the right fluctuations. And this was shown a long time ago, and I'm mentioning this because some recent papers were disputing this. Um, so this, um, you can consider a, a space-time on the boundary, a space, sorry, on the boundary that has some small wiggles, and you're trying to calculate the probability that you see wiggles uh, of different amplitudes and so on. And you get that the probabilities are exactly the same as the ones you would get by uh, the usual uh, Zeta vacuum, the, the Bunch-Davis vacuum. Um, now, it's important for this that the, the geometries that you fill in are complex geometries. So they ha there is this evolution into Euclidean time, and the uh, geometries uh, for the fluctuations, for example, they have, there is a positive frequency condition that comes from the demand that when you go to Euclidean time, they behave well. And it's essential that they are complex uh, because you are evaluating e to the i s, and if they were real, then you would get uh, here just a pure phase and independent of the fluctuations. But what you actually get is a Gaussian, to lead in order is Gaussian, uh, and suppressed as you go to large H. Okay. So that's uh, important for getting the right answer. Of course, uh, this hartle hawking wave function has one well-known phenomenological problem. Um, and the phenomenological problem is that, uh, well, there are many ways of thinking about this problem, and each person has its own favorite way of thinking about it. So uh, my favorite way is to think about it in the context of inflation, because that's the context in which we uh, think about small fluctuations and in which we compare the predictions of small fluctuations to the data and so on. So now uh, you can ask whether you 
could have a prediction or a, at least a calculation of the probability that the universe has uniform curvature, right? We, we measure small curvature fluctuations in the CMB primordial fluctuations, and you can ask, well, what's the probability that the universe has positive curvature, positive uniform curvature? Now, we know that the universe at least uh, has some curvature of uh, bigger, radius of curvature bigger than eight, uh, around 80 gigaparsecs today, and you can um, take that distance and evolve it back to the time of inflation, and it crosses uh, the um, the horizon during inflation at some time, phi star. And then at this time, you can uh, approximate the universe as being uh, the sitter, and then you can calculate the uh, wave function as, uh, as Hartle and Hawking calculated it. And so that gives something. Uh, but then you can ask, well, what if the universe was a little smaller than that? Uh, then uh, from the fact that the potential has some tilt, you can calculate the difference in probability between those two situations and it gives a huge uh, dependence on the radius of the universe. So that wants to make the radius of the universe smaller. And there is a, an exponent here which is given by the amplitude of the fluctuations. So the amplitude that we measure in the CMB. So, th so this, is a, a, well, this is a concrete problem and there are many ideas for uh, dealing with this problem. I, I don't have a favorite uh, resolution. So something, something is wrong in the wave function of the universe, this idea. Uh, but something is also right. I mean, it gave the right uh, fluctuations. And also, it's right in the context of ADS. So if we did the same thing in ADS, that's part of the standard ADS-CFT uh, relationship, the conjecture. And uh, it, in, in particular, it gives not only the right result for small fluctuations, which are correlation functions of the stress tensor, but also the right result in the context of S3. There are beautiful matches between the S3 partition functions and these ADS uh, calculations. Um, I would like to point out that these two problems are closely related. So the, the, the Sitter problem is related to uh, what I would call the minus uh, Euclidean ADS problem. And the relation is the following. So let's start with the red line here. So this red line uh, represents the contour that we follow in the original uh, hurdle hawking prescription. So we have the metric of the Sitter. Time increases here to the right. Um, and so we go back in time, we go to uh, time equal to zero, and then uh, we go in Euclidean time to uh, this place where the universe looks like an S4, and here the, the S3 shrinks to nothing. Okay, so that's the original hartle hawking contour. Now we could uh, consider a different contour um, where we set tau equal to i pi over two plus tau tilde, and if we do that, uh, we, we insert in this metric, the metric we get, is uh, this metric, which is the metric of ADS4, except that Euclidean ADS4, or hyperbolic space, uh, except that it has an additional minus sign in front, okay? Um, so this is a particular analytic continuation. It's, uh, it gives an equivalent answer to this other one, so the answer does not depend on which contour we take. Um, but in this contour, it's more manifest that we have a problem very similar to the ADS problem. And then this part of the contour only uh, affects the, what we are normally called counter terms in the ADS language. Mm. And it's important to point out that we are not modifying the original Lagrangian. So this metric here uh, is a solution uh, of Einstein's equations with positive cosmological constant. And it manages to be a solution uh, because of this overall minus sign. Okay, so we're imagining uh, evaluating in the same Lagrangian, but with a metric which has been analytically continued. Um, okay, so uh, I, I now would like to uh, open a small parenthesis and make a comment on the relation to the Archi flow and how uh, thinking about this wave function of the universe is useful for that. Um, now the Archi flow has been, uh, in the ADS context, has been discussed by many people. Um, and so I'm going to offer only a minor improvement on what was discussed before. So we have the uh, wave function of the universe. Uh, it can be expanded um, for large values of the metric uh, in terms of pieces which look like the area, the area times the curvature, and so on. And then some piece that depends only on ratios of metric components. Um, and that is finite when the metric, the overall scale of the metric goes to infinity. Now what we'll do is we'll uh, introduce another uh, wave function, which we'll call the UV wave function. So this is a wave function that depends on some parameter, uh, G naught. And G naught is considered to be the asymptotic boundary condition 
for this wave function. And the idea is that you start from a delta function at infinity, and then you uh, evolve that function uh, into the interior. Uh, and what we have here is sort of the other solution. So we have the growing solution, and then there is the decreasing solution. And you, you take this decreasing solution, and the idea is that this decreasing solution encodes the renormalization group trajectory of the coupling. So this encodes how the couplings depend on scale. Um, and it's a first order equation because we're taking only one of the solutions of the, of the full, um, of the full, let's say, wheeler de Witt equation. Um, and it's independent of, of the state that you had in the field theory or of the particular infrared solutions. And then you have uh, this, the CFT partition function. The idea is that it is the inner product between this UV partition function and uh, the w some general wave function of the universe. Uh, sometimes this was previously called in the Hermsker Polchinski paper as sine for red times psi UV. Um, and this inner product is the Klein Gordon inner product, which is uh, evaluated on a slice of uh, superspace. Um, so, the improvement, so this equation is a very similar equation appearing in the paper of Hermsek and Polchinski. And the improvement is that now both pieces, so both the psi UV and psi uh, infrared, both obey the, uh, the Wheeler De Witt equation. Okay. And so, um, so you can. Uh, once you choose a semi-classical geometry and so on, this, um, the fact that you're doing the Klein-Gordon norm, and the Klein-Gordon norm is independent of the slice you choose in superspace, so that slice in superspace translates into a slice here in, uh, in the solution, and we can think of this as the place where we are evaluating that, that inner product, and the fact that the answer is independent of the slice is related to the renormalization group invariance of the theory. Okay, it's a manifestation of that. Okay, so that's the end of the Euclidean ADS context, um, ADS and RC comment. Um, so I, I was talking about the hurdle hawking wave functions, and so I think it's something interesting to study. Uh, maybe when we understand them well enough, uh, this phenomenological problem we mentioned will go away. Um, and or perhaps uh, even the study of the hurdle hawking wave functions might be a, a piece in how we think about the problem in general. And of course, this is the famous measure problem or information problem in cosmology. So we'll now uh, study this wave function in a very simple context, in the context of nearly ds2 gravity. So this is a simple uh, De Sitter theory. It arises uh, as the limit of certain four-dimensional computations. So in the same way that uh, Sandeep Trivedi mentioned yesterday that um, you get nearly ads2 gravity from near extrema black holes, in the same way uh, if you, you can have solutions of four-dimensional gravity where the universe starts as a two-dimensional, um, as D, nearly ds2 times uh, two-sphere, and uh, you have a period of two-dimensional inflation and then a period of four-dimensional inflation. And in those situations, the calculations we're going to discuss are, are relevant, even for four-dimensional physics. Uh, but we'll study for now this theory on its own. Uh, so this is a theory where we, the simplest version of the theory is just simply um, similar to what was discussed in the ADS context, it contains a topological term that contributes only to the entropy, and then a piece that uh, is the Jacquip Teitelbaum action, uh, similar to what was discussed before, except that now we have a minus sign. And as before, when we integrate uh, over phi, we fix the metric to be uh, ds2, um, and we are left only with this term in the action, and that term in the action uh, gives. Uh, some piece which is proportional to the length, and some other piece which uh, has the form of the Schwarzian derivative. So what we're doing is we have this metric that is fixed to ds2, and then uh, the actual physical boundary of the space will be some surface which in that fixed ds2 metric, and um, so u here is the proper length along this uh, spatial slice. And again, this uh, form of this form follows uh, from the symmetries in particular from the asymptotic uh, reparametrization symmetries of ds2, which uh, have been uh, both spontaneously and explicitly broken by these terms. Um, so, as we, so we uh, have a picture where we have uh, the Sitter space, we have this uh, boundary here, um, and each of these, so implicitly there are two, uh, two boundaries, because there is one for the wave function and one for the complex conjugate of the wave function. So there are two independent Schwarzian modes that should be integrated out. And these are 
off-shell modes that uh, we integrate out. They don't correspond to physical degrees of freedom. They're just off-shell modes that we uh, should integrate out to get the right answer. Um, and using them, we can uh, consider various quantum gravity corrections. Uh, so I'll discuss uh, two examples. So we'll discuss uh, the wave function in the pure JT theory, and then we'll discuss uh, quantum corrections to matter correlators in the theory of JT plus matter. So if you look at the wave function in uh, JT theory, we, uh, we can just uh, find it. So there's this piece that comes from the, the Sitter entropy. Uh, well, it's really half of the Sitter entropy. And then these other two pieces are the ones that I mentioned before, one proportional to the length of the boundary, and the other uh, coming from evaluating the, that, um, that Schwarzschild action uh, on the classical solution. Um, um, time, there is some time dilation problem here. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so now that's classically. Quantum mechanically, we uh, can multiply by, uh, well, we. Quantum mechanically, when we integrate over the fluctuations, uh, we uh, get this uh, factor of uh, L, L to the three halves. Uh, that's uh, similar to what was obtained previously when considered quantizing the Schwarzschild. And the only difference is that now we have an I in front, but everything else is exactly the same. And we take the square of the wave function, we get a factor of one over L cubed times, so this is just from this one loop factor, the classical piece cancels, and then we have the Zeter entropy. So it's a situation where we can compute the quantum corrections to the wave function of the universe in a rather simple way. So all, all perturbative corrections can be computed. Um, similarly, uh, we can consider matter fields that propagate in this DS2, and we can uh, compute the gravitational corrections by considering propagators of this uh, Schwarzian mode. And this encodes various effects, like, for example, if you create a massive particle, it will make the universe expand a little slower, and then a second correlator in the presence of that will have different form, and all of those effects are simply uh, taken into account by this type of correlators. These computations are very similar to the, to the ADS2 computations. There is just this extra I in the action for the Schwarzians. We have two Schwarzians, and we found the leading corrections. And there it's certainly much simpler to compute gravitational corrections in this context than in uh, four-dimensional gravity, where the, uh, some computations ha have also been done. Um, and it might be useful for answering some questions about the infrared effects in gravity and so on. Um, now, another uh, issue is, uh, can we uh, talk about contributions from other geometries? And we, ho we, heard we heard a couple of days ago about this beautiful work by Sal, Schenker, and Stanford, where they considered the contribution from various geometries in the ADS2 case. And they had to sum over surfaces with constant negative curvature. Now, suppose you want to sum uh, this in, the, in this case. So naively, we need, well, we need positive curvature geometries. And naively, we only have S2. But uh, we also have minus all the previous ones. And as we explained before, if we put an overall minus sign in the metric, we um, get a geometry which we can interpret as a particular contribution to a hurdle hawking like uh, computation. And as we said before, all these geometries with an overall minus sign in the metric, they are all have positive curvature. They formally have positive curvature, even though the geometry is just the same as the ones we had before. So we see that we have uh, an identical problem, and uh, the moduli space of these solutions is the same, so we have an integral over the same moduli space. And the only difference is that we have an extra i uh, for these wiggles at infinity. So we get the same answer of uh, the um, of S cubed here. S cubed is not the S3, something else. Um, <coughs> and um, we, all we have to do is replace beta by minus IL, OK? And so th also, the completion of this, they showed that, well, they argued it was given by a matrix integral. And uh, that sounds very interesting. I don't know what the interpretation of this matrix is in the uh, DS2 context. Maybe you could say, well, it's a trivial thing because it has, it's so similar to the previous case, but maybe this is giving us a, an interesting lesson of one solvable DS2 theory where we can do all these calculations and maybe we should extract the right lesson. I, 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 I don't know exactly what the right lesson is. So I leave it as a homework exercise. Um, um, now, um, another question is the following. So we 
Normally, when we compute these hartle hawking wave functions, we think of the wave function of the universe as, well, they give, us for, they give for us a wave function of the universe, which is a pure state. So we have, let's say, one boundary, we fill it in, and so on, and we get some wave function, and we get exactly the, the complex conjugate wave function for the other case. And so in the end, we get a pure state. Um, but the same logic that leads to the hartle hawking wave function leads also to a density matrix, so to a situation where you could connect the two geometries uh, to each other, so the bra geometry and the ket geometry. So we have this contour, and when we go in Euclidean space here, we could connect them uh, to each other. We can call this a bracket reunification. Um, now, this looks exotic, but it's actually pretty conventional. Uh, ordinary thermal states in quantum field theory are produced by such a contour, so in the same way that uh, the I epsilon contour was uh, uh, an inspiration for the hartle hawking This is also, uh, let's say, an inspiration from thermal field theories for this kind of contour. Um, now, in nearly ADS2 gravity, we have actually uh, one example of a, of a contribution like this, uh, which is the double cone geometry discussed also in this paper. And they uh, give us, um, so we can interpret this as perhaps two entangled universes, but we prefer to think of it as the density a contribution to the density matrix of a single universe. So we think of this uh, L as the length scale of uh, the universe, and we uh, have a density, a contribution to the density matrix, which is a function of the two lengths, and is equal to the partition function that they obtain for uh, this geometry. And after we do the right analytic continuations, there is a difference in sign because one is a bra and the other is a cat. Uh, we get this, uh, this, this density matrix. Um, the, the Hassan overall I, it's a uh, Hermitian, um, and it has a peculiar feature that it diverges when the two uh, lengths are equal. I'm not sure how to uh, interpret that. Uh, notice that this is a subleading contribution to the density matrix. The leading contribution comes from the two separate disks, um, and uh, this is down by, uh, by the Decitter entropy compared to the previous one. Now, in more general theories of gravity, you can wonder whether there are also uh, solutions like this that connect uh, the bra and the cat, let's say, and we search for time-dependent solutions of this kind. So I, I should mention that the usual the sitter solution uh, in the static patch can be viewed in this way because it's a state in thermal equilibrium. Um, and we search for time-dependent de solutions of this kind, but we didn't find one that we liked. I mean, there was one these authors consider one where the number of fields is proportional to the Sitter entropy, but as we heard uh, this morning, this is uh, in the region where the weak gravity, well, where uh, we're not supposed to trust quantum field theory. Um, and there are also some unstable solutions that connect, have Euclidean wormholes that connect uh, the two sides. And there are also some uh, other prescriptions one could explore. Uh, but they lead to wave functions that aren't suppressed in some directions. And we'll probably summarize some of these attempts in our paper, but I don't want to continue. But I, I'd like to mention some motivation for why we were thinking about this, about these solutions that I like to call cosmological wormholes. Um, it's the idea that even if the universe, there was a wave function of the universe that was a pure state, uh, when we do any, uh, in our real universe, there are many parts of the universe that we don't see, so we are tracing over them. Um, and we have a density matrix for the observed part of the universe. Now, uh, if you come from, uh, if you think about that perhaps something like DSCFT, DSCFT is correct, uh, then each wave function will be given by some field theory. And when we are doing this trace, we are uh, taking those two field theories and couple them to each other. And in other situations, in, in ADS, when we couple two field theories, in some cases we get uh, wormholes connecting the two uh, geometries associated to these field theories. Um, and so it would be natural that uh, we get something like this. Also notice that um, in the context of cosmology, um, it is natural to, it is a little more natural to average over couplings. So it might be that the observations we make in the universe are not precise enough to determine all the couplings of the theory, and then we could average. We certainly average over uh, the, the parts of the universe we don't observe, but maybe we're also implicitly averaging over coupling. So it's a context where that is uh, fairly natural. 
So one could wonder where there is a direct way to compute the observed density matrix uh, of the universe. I don't have anything to say about that, but just raise it as an interesting question. Um, so in conclusions, we reviewed some aspects of the hazard hawking wave function. We slightly improved the picture for the RG flow in usual ADSFT. We introduced this nearly DS2 gravity, and we computed perturbative quantum gravity effects in this nearly ADS2 theory. And we mentioned that the sum over topologies is the same as the one considered by Sachs, Schenker, and Stanford. So you could say that this is just a, a reinterpretation of uh, their formulas. And we discussed why uh, it is natural to expect this kind of uh, cosmological wormholes, but I really owe you a good example other than the, the Sitter static patch. Thank you. Are there questions for Juan? When you consider the negative uh, anti dissipative space, the sign of the action for fluctuations isn't that clear because you have to pick the sign of the square root of the determinant. Yes. But it seems hard to make the fluctuation action positive for both scalars and gauge fields. Yeah, you would have to uh, continue the contour of the, of the integration contour of the scalars. For, for example, even for the scalars, you would. Uh, continue the integration contour. So for example, imagine you have a conformally coupled scalar, right? So then um, you would say that the sign of the metric doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter only if uh, you change the contour of integration of the scalar because the conformal transformation Im involves a, 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 an eye in the scalar, um, uh, an eye in the, con I mean, just from the usual way we transform scalars. And it's similar for the, so for the gauge fields, you, well, if we were in four dimensions, for example, there would not be any, due to conformal invariance, you would not, not need to do anything. Um. Um, yeah, there is something over there. Oh, here, yeah. Sorry. So in your yes. two-dimensional example, um, is there an analog of the phenomenological problem that you sketched? No. And if so, does the sum over topologies or the perturbative quantum corrections alleviate this problem? Yeah. Uh, no, there isn't an analog. Uh, and um, um, yeah, so in this problem, it's a little nicer. So the, there is one little issue, which is the, the fact that the, the, when you computed the, this wave function that we discussed here, um, as uh, you, if you try to integrate over L, you get the divergence at small l, right? Um, and well, so that uh, looks like a sickness of this theory, uh, of, of this problem. Um, if you embed it in four dimensions and, um, and consider the full four dimensional solution, then uh, this is cured due to some terms in four dimensions that are not covered by uh, this. They come from expanding to higher orders the, the, the four dimensional action you get a term that cures this divergence. So in th that context, there is uh, an actual uh, subtle point that uh, makes sense that balances quantum, these quantum effects against classical effects. But of course, if you now go to four dimensions, there is another solution, which is the S3 solution. And that has much, uh, is more dominant than these ones, than the ones that contain these black holes. So in that sense, the problem really comes back again. So. Juan, to go back to the phenomenological problem you mentioned yeah. with the hartle hawking uh, wave function, uh, the fact that you get exponential, yeah, m to the 4 v5 with a positive uh, sign uh, depends a little bit on, it does it depend a little bit on what kind of contour you choose? Uh, if it were minus, it might be yes, yes. the right direction. No, it, it does depend on that, but this contour is the one that, um, the contour chosen is the one that corresponds to the I epsilon prescription, and it's the one that gives you the right uh, fluctuations for, for small fluctuations. So, so you can't get both things right if you, miss, if you change that sign? No, no, you can't get both things right. So, so some people say, oh, I, I changed, the, I, I changed the, the contour, and then you get the wrong sign, for the wrong prediction for the fluctuations. So. Now, I have to say that this all, all relies on this philosophy of fixing the, the geometry in the future and then filling it in uh, using this. I mean, you could, of course, uh, say, well, I have a different philosophy. I say the universe started small. I make this as a prior, and then, let's say, tunnels out to some bigger, bigger value. That's the v uh proposal. And this is certainly uh, one of the ways to 
uh, get out of this. But this requires us to, well, know the prior st uh, state of the universe and, well, mo most of the ways to deal with uh, the hurdle hawking, uh, pr to, to get rid of this uh, problem, involve assuming a previous history for the universe. So say some assumption about what the history is like and that the universe is really not in thermal equilibrium and so on. You more or less said already, but uh, I think uh, one of the standard interpretation of Hubble Hawking wave function was this is a, like a fictitious uh, uh, stationary, like a final final stage of like a lot of Dositta minimum without any Minkowski and anti Dositta, so that's why it's proportional to the E3 entropy of the Dositta space. Then that does mean that it's not necessarily, you know, the problem to. <laughs> Because you cannot use this to the cosmology, given that initial Yes, yes, yes. Well, th th that's the question of, of what you assume, whether we, we were in a stationary state or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't but have it's a, like a special state? I just, I, special state. I, I just mentioned this problem because uh, <laughs> I was going, well, we were discussing the hurdle hawking wave function in two dimensions, etc. And I felt for completeness <laughs> okay. I had to mention the problem. Okay. Should we also include the uh, unorientable surfaces uh, depending on the number of TTFDs that couples do that? Yes, yes. Well, uh, yeah, I guess that's a definition of the theory, right? So we could define a theory where we sum over orientable surface, which is what we discussed here. I mean, that's the same as what SSS discussed. And we uh, could also consider just summing over non-orientable surfaces, as Edward discussed in his talk. Okay, I suggest that we thank Juan. The next speaker is V. Bern from UCLA.